I would like to extend my warmest greetings and welcome to all our distinguished speakers and guests to the inaugural event for the C20 Working Group on Education and Digital Transformation. India took up the G20 presidency this year, and the C20 is a forum for civic society organizations or CSOs to offer a wide range of civic society perspectives and produce concrete recommendations and policy proposals to the G20. Through multiple engagement strategies, we aim to study, gather, and recommend policies and best practices to address various challenges at both the global and country level. This inaugural event will initiate discussions on how education and digital transformation can affect social change and improve the lives of people all around the world. We are happy to note that we have ISL support today and live transcription. We, we will start with a prayer. Dhyaya Mudhavala Vagundhanavati Tejo Mai Nishtaki Snitha Panka Viloki Bhagavati Mandasmita Shri Mukhi Valsalya Mritavarshini Sumaturam Sangirtana Lapini Shamanki Matusikta Suktim Amrita Nindatmika Ishwari Amrita Nindatmika Ishwari Amrita Nindatmika Ishwari I take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Prema Nedungadi, coordinator of the working group on education and digital transformation. Dr. Prema is the director of Amrita Create, the Amrita Center for Research in Analytics, Technologies and Education, and chair of Amrita School of Computing, Amritapuri. She received the Digital India Award from the Honorable Minister of Ministry of Communication and Information Technology in the category Digital Empowerment. The IT Excellence Award for e-learning and education from Computer Society of India and was a winner in the Barbara Bush Foundation Adult Literacy X Prize competition. She has over 100 research publications to her credit. I invite Dr. Prema to deliver the welcome address. Om Om Amrita Namaha. A warm and heartfelt welcome to each one of you. We are privileged and excited to welcome you to the inaugural event of the C20 India Working Group. There is a vast potential to join hands and seek solutions to the world's challenges at this critical time. Under the guidance of our C20 chair, we hope to move forward with hearts united, ready to listen, discuss, collaborate towards policy recommendation. We will work on policy recommendations with a collective understanding of pain points and best practices from civic society across countries to uplift and empower people across G20 nations and beyond. This is an exceptional and unparalleled chance for us to positively impact the lives of two thirds of the global population residing in G20 countries. Along with the deliberations on policy, we propose 
action-oriented items to impact the world positively. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce and welcome our eminent guests who have graced us with their presence. Sampooja Swami Amrita Swarupananda Puri is the Vice Chairman of the Mata Amritananda Mai Math and President of Amrita Vishwa Vidya Pitham. He is the head disciple of renowned humanitarian and spiritual leader, Sri Mata Amritananda Mai Devi Amma. He holds a master's in philosophy and is a renowned author, prolific speaker, and has authored several books, including The Irresistible Attraction of Divinity, The Color of the Rainbow, Compassionate Leadership, as well as Amma's biography. He is a magnificent singer and composer and has traveled around the world more than 30 times with Amma in her service. We are blessed to have Swamiji address the gathering. Ambassador Vijay Nambiar is one of India's most distinguished and finest diplomats, having represented India as an ambassador in Afghanistan, Malaysia, China, Pakistan, and then the United Nations. He served as Deputy National Security Advisor until 2006, when he was seconded to the UN as Special Advisor to UNSG Kofi Annan. He was later Chef de Cabinet to UNSG Ban Ki-moon and his advisor on Myanmar. Nambiar, sir, strongly believes that India is a rising power and its commitment to democracy, climate change, human rights, etc., makes it a legitimate claimant for a rightful place on the high table in the UN Security Council. We are very happy to have Dr. Venkat Rangan, who is the Vice Chancellor of Amrita Vishwa Vidya Pitham. Previously, Dr. Rangan founded and directed the Multimedia Lab and Internet and Wireless Networks Research at the University of California, San Diego, where he served as a professor. He is an internationally recognized pioneer of research in multimedia systems and internet e-commerce. He also leads the education at Amrita Vishwavidya Pitham. Dr. Rangan has over 100 publications in international journals and conferences and over 20 US patents. I welcome our honored guest, Dr. Anil Sahasrabudhe, who is the chairman of National Educational Technology Forum, AICTE. Professor Anil Sahasrabudhe has a doctorate from the Indian Institute of Science, Anglo. He served as the director of COEP and chairman of the Empowered Basic Science Research Committee of the UGC. He was also the chairman of AICT until September 2022. He has won several awards and fellowships with his strong academic leadership and innovative abilities in the area of technology development. He will highlight the digital transformation in education for desired learning outcomes and skills for employability. I'm honored to welcome you, sir, on behalf of the C20 chair and our working group, Education and Digital Transformation. We have Dr. Juiced Monks as our international collaborator and also coordinator for this working group. He's an executive director um, at HQAI and lecturer at the University of Geneva. He's a longtime advisor and friend to Amrita Vishwavidya Pitham. Um, he serves as the executive director of Humanitarian Quality Assurance Initiative, a leading humanitarian and development sector Previously, he was the executive director of the International Education Policy Think Tank based at the Graduate Institute Geneva, and he worked extensively as a management strategy consultant and auditor in a broad range of international development and humanitarian organizations, NGOs, ministries, philanthropic organizations. He obtained his PhD in political economy from the University of Geneva. A hearty welcome to all members of various civil society organizations, partners, and all the participants who have joined us today from multiple countries around the world. 
We hope that this inaugural session paves the way to strengthen dialogues between CSOs and its agreed starting point for our journey towards C20 India 2023. We are immensely grateful for the invaluable support of the government of India, the NGO, civil society partners, the UN and international partner organizations in this noble cause. I'm honored to welcome everyone who has graced this occasion on behalf of the C20 chair and the working group, Education and Digital Transformation. Namishivai. Dr. Prema, thank you so much. The following video presentation outlines Amma's larger vision for this working group. Could we have the video, please? When we study in college, striving to become a doctor, lawyer, or engineer, this is education for a living. On the other hand, education for life requires an understanding of the essential principles of spirituality. The real goal of education is not to create people who can understand only the language of machines. The main purpose of education should be to impart a culture of the heart, a culture based on enduring values. Digital transformation is a bridge that can be used to instill awareness and strengthen the deep bonds students have between their nations, the world, fellow human beings, and nature. It is a tool that can be used to unify our relationships as a global family instead of creating a technological divide. Through these channels, we can help achieve the SDGs more effectively by connecting people, organizations, and resources that enable greater collaboration and impact. Digital education is an inclusive model that is for everyone. It can reach people in the most remote rural areas. It can be affordable for people who are economically disadvantaged. It can provide a means of communication for people with disabilities. The C20 Education and Digital Transformation Working Group will focus on inclusive education and accessibility, skill development, education for life, digital transformation, technology-enabled learning, and future of education. This working group also aims at addressing mental health awareness and solutions for substance abuse with a specific focus on how this impacts today's youth and people from impoverished populations. By connecting through community-based programs, health and social awareness can empower and build resilience in people who have fallen into depression and addiction due to poor socioeconomic conditions. As the ultimate goal, they can return to confidence and dignity in their cultural diversity. Join our dialogues to ensure that education and digital technology are for a sustainable and equitable future. They are inclusive and accessible, regardless of background, location, or ability. Thank you so much. Uh, with this, I join Dr. Prema in welcoming the distinguished speakers and esteemed personalities here. Now, I invite Sampujya Swami Amrita Sarupananda Puri, Vice Chairman of Mata Amrita Nandamai Mat and President of Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peetam. Please allow me to seek your divine presence to address us, Swamiji. I humbly bow down at Amma's sacred lotus feet. My namaskarams and loving greetings to all the eminent speakers, dignitaries, valued viewers and listeners. Since I'm not a technologist, educationalist or scientist, I would like to share some thoughts that uh, you may not cover. So let me begin by quoting Amma. I quote, the goal of our educational system should not be just to mold a generation who can understand the language of machines. It should also focus on developing the language of uh, a culture of the heart. It should also focus on developing 
a culture of the heart, which will help our youngsters to be humble. They should learn to respect, revere, and love nature and people who belong to other cultures as well. Knowledge, understanding, reverence, and love should go hand in hand. And that's the way to real growth. Unquote. We all know that the Latin root of the word education is educare. In other words, to educe means to draw or to bring up something that lies deep within you. It's like drawing water from a well, from the unknown to the known, from the unmanifest to the manifest, from the deepest recesses of your heart to the subconscious and unconscious minds, and from there, it should enrich oneself and then the entire world. As the eminent scientist Albert Einstein pointed out, everyone who is seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that a spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of man and one in the face of which we, with our modest powers, must feel humble. In today's world, people tend to give more importance to logic, totally forgetting the, the mysterious aspect of nature. We need to educate our youngsters about the mysterious aspect. So basically, a logic and mystery should go together, or logic, fact, and faith. Logic and mystery, fact, and faith should go hand in hand. From kindergarten to the highest classes, we always had a guide, a teacher. This was the past. Listening was the medium of learning. That mode of acquiring knowledge will soon become history. The future is that of seeing and visualizing. In fact, seeing, or to be more precise, observation and listening should go hand in hand. Because for every knowledge to become part of the person or to go deep into oneself, observation is most important. Because observation leads to meditation, and from meditation, you gain real knowledge. You, you gain wisdom. However, with the fast approaching knowledge explosion, the listening aspect will have to disappear, which definitely will have disadvantages, but it is unavoidable. Education without computer technology and digitization or digital and, dig, and digitalization digitalization will be almost impossible. Of course, the changes are going to be revolutionary, no doubt about that. Nonetheless, there will also be backlash and disadvantages, such as the, such as the degeneration of values, disintegration of families, loneliness, increase in mental illnesses, addictions, violence, and other fatal reactions. The question is, how do we manage and create a balance between listening and seeing the possible out of control situation that is staring at us? Amma says, I quote, until quite recently, modern scientists believed that the universe and all living beings existed as separate entities without any real relation to each other. Today, the outlook of scientists has completely changed. Science now claims that minuscule movements in stars, light years away, impacts even the small blades of grass on planet Earth. Unquote. Similarly, generations impact each other. We must set good examples for the younger generation. Our youngsters need good role models loving and compassionate guides and mentors to emulate. And we should also know that there's a belief that the younger generation is 
careless. They are not careless, they are careless. They are not useless, but used in us. Amma says, I go to youth is the midpoint of life. The most ideal time in a person's life to gain inner transformation, to cultivate healthy habits. It's a time when we are neither children nor adults. It's a time in life when we, one can live in the moment. It is the midpoint of life. It is the ideal stage for training the mind. Unquote. We live in a world where selfishness and cruelty are growing day by day. Anything can happen anywhere to anyone at any time. This is a situation. Some people think that poverty is one of the root causes of people to join terrorist groups. Well, we have read news articles about the 2016 Dhaka or Bangladesh shooting. None of the young men who handpicked and butchered 20 innocent people from various parts of the world were from poor families, nor were they un uneducated. They were educated kids from upper middle class families who turned murderers. Allow me to quote Amma again. I quote, home, home is the source of both a person's good qualities and bad qualities. Almost everything that influences a child's mental health comes from their family environment. By the time a child is eight or nine years old, the foundation has already been laid for 70% of their mental growth. A person may live up to 80 or 90, but by the time they are 10, they have already learned the most important lessons in their life. Only the remaining 30% is learned after that. And this learning is built upon the foundation of strengths and weaknesses developed during childhood. So we need role models in all areas of life. In fact, everyone should become a role model because whether we know it or not, someone somewhere is looking, us, uh, looking up to us for inspiration. Unquote. Whether you are head of a family, chief of an organization, or leader of a country, if you have a caring attitude, humbleness in approach, and the inclination to sacrifice your own personal interests and comforts, then you will be remembered, adored, and loved as someone who truly has no replacement. Your name and your actions will always remain as a guiding light to humanity. Our entire life is a web of relationships. It is one whole, and this is what is signified by, represented by Vasudhaiva Kutumbagam. Just like the, the whole digital world, it is one world web, a web of millions of links. Scott McNeely, the earlier CEO and co-founder of Sun Microsystems has once said, network the computer. And what is our computer today? Is it a server? Is it a desktop? Is it a laptop? Is it a notebook? Is it a mobile phone? Is it some other digital device? The computer today is a network of millions of devices interacting together seamlessly towards one common platform called the web. The whole world wide web is actually one computer. Unquote. The Bhagavad Gita says, Sarvada Panipadam Tat Sarvatokshi Siro Mukham Sarvada Sudimaloge Sarvam Sarvam Avradam Dishtabi. This is the this is a verse from the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, 14th verse. The meaning is the undivided supreme consciousness has its hands, feet, eyes, heads, and faces everywhere. Its ears, too, are in all places, for it pervades everything in the universe. So modern, modern people, the youngsters especially, think that the vegetables we buy in the market do not come from some farm, but they are available uh, because some star millions of miles away is giving light to it. So we think that the vegetables we buy in are from the market or from a farm. 
our life on this planet earth is very delicate deluded as we are we forget this undeniable truth of unity we live in age of instant breakfasts lunches and dinners while preparing our food in our microwave oven we tend to forget that the food we are eating does not originate at the supermarket what is true is that a star millions of kilometers away gives light and energy to plants and planet earth which feeds us and the animals too my point is the world is totally moving towards digitization and digitalization while trying to trash all the so called old ways of living life and acquisition of knowledge in our haste to change everything we shouldn't forget the fundamental values of life we shouldn't forget the difference between education for life and education for living as amma puts it i remember a story a man was seen walking in great discomfort he was cursing himself and was almost in tears owing to pain a passer by asked him sir what is wrong you seem to be in agonizing pain are you okay do you need help the man replied no 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 i'm all right it, it is just the shoes and what's wrong with your shoes sir you know they are too small for me to be precise one and a half inches too small so the passer by asked sir then why do you wear them the man said it is such a joy when i take them off in the evening so are we following the footsteps of this man in the story there is this typical interview question where do you see yourself in 5 years but do we ever ask ourselves who will i be in 5 years that's a much more valid question whether we ask this question and contemplate on it things are going to change within and without many countries have created a separate ministry for happiness has happiness become such a rare commodity do we have to be taught how to be happy yes that's the situation an observation of our surroundings sends strong indications that future could be like that here is something that you may want to contemplate when i was 5 years old my mom always told me that happiness was the key to life when i went to school they asked me what i wanted to be when i grew up i wrote down happy they told me i did not understand the assignment and i told them they did not understand life amma says i quote from kindergarten to grade 12 education as well as in higher education a course that teaches compassion and selflessness should be created a mandatory textbook including all aspects of the greatness of selflessness and compassion should be introduced so to conclude while computer education digitization digitization and digitalization are inevitable let us also leave some brain space to educate our children on love compassion happiness and selflessness so that the world will be a better place for humans and other living beings can coexist in peace and harmony thank you so much om amrudeshwariye namaha thank you so much swami ji for your illuminating words of wisdom now it is time to move on to the inaugural address i cordially invite shri vijay nambiar ji the principal coordinator of c20 to deliver the inaugural address that was a most inspiring and revelatory uh, statement made by swami ji let me first of all express to you how honored i am to participate today at this inaugural session of the working group on <clears throat> education and digital transformation as chair of the c20 mata amritanandamayi devi or amma 
exemplifies a vision of civil society where the individual and family work not in competition or conflict with society markets in the state, but rather to supplement their pursuits of overall harmony. The work of India's civil society groups cuts across a multitude of sectors. As you are all aware, we have set up 14 working groups under a variety of thematic heads. They are set up in accordance with the so-called Osaka principles of the C20, representing both the continuity of traditional concerns as well as newer priorities of relevance to the changing world. India's presidency, as Swamiji has said, uh, is based on the motto Vasudheva Kutumbakam, which calls on each of us to move away from narrow sentiments of mine and thine and to embrace a larger perspective to, that celebrates the bounties of nature and the world around in a spirit of unity, respect, and compassion. If education is to support the G20 goal of one earth, one family, one future, it must be affordable, learner-centered, inclusive and enhanced by innovations, while at the same time being respectful towards the principles of cultural diversity, accessibility in local languages, and sensitive to the learning abilities of the children themselves. Amma has in her profound wisdom and insight reflected this in the words that education should spread light within and outside, instill awareness, and strengthen the deep bond between the student and his nation, the world, his fellow human beings and other creatures, nature and God. Now, many of you are domain experts and have spent long years committed to your mission in this subject of education and digital transformation. It is presumptuous for me to speak on these issues to you, but I shall nevertheless share certain common general statements uh, <clears throat> which you may find perhaps just repetition. The socioeconomic turmoil induced by the pandemic of the past few years impacted all areas of human activity and education was no exception. According to the UNESCO, over 87% of the world's student population was affected by lockdowns and quarantines, and more than a billion and a half students were absent from schools and other educational institutions. While the pandemic itself led to a setback in SDG 4, Educational institutions also learned to be more resilient and even inclusive and leveraged technology in a manner they'd never done before. They have tried to address learning losses and sought to minimize the impact on vulnerable and disadvantaged communities. The suddenness and volatility of the events did cause a whole set of disruptive changes, but they also resulted in quick adaptation by both students and teachers as well as by the managers of academia to a new learning landscape. In the process, integrated tech-assisted online education made learning a new and exciting interactive experience. It is not as if digital learning was entirely a new area for us, even in India. Several startups have been co cooperating and collaborating with academic institutions for some years now, but the experience of the lockdown and the social distancing guidelines only accelerated this transformation and in a sense converted, into, converted it into a new normal. The scholar Noah Hariri, Yuval Noah Harari, in his book, 21 Lessons from the, for the 21st Century, reflected on how schools continue to focus on traditional rote learning methods and not on skills such as critical thinking and ad adaptability, which are more important for success of every person in the future. Some independent reports have suggested that online learning increases retention of information and takes much less time as compared to conventional methods of learning. But this claim has also been contested, so one is not sure what the exact situation is. While indubitably some downsides have also emerged in the prolonged separation of students from the classroom and from the experience of online learning over extended periods of the COVID pandemic, which obviously needs to be addressed seriously in their various ramifications. I tend to think that the transition to digital and online learning during this period has proven that it is possible and even perhaps beneficial 
to continue to explore the range of innovative avenues for education, which can thus fulfill the goals of SDG4 on quality education. However, for online education to sustain in the longer run, proper training, sufficient bandwidth ability, availability, and appropriate preparations are imperative. This is increasingly realized and novel ways are being found to make such education more efficient, streamlined, and competitive in today's, to address today's learning needs. Some years ago, there was a BCG study which observed that the path, of, path forward involves bringing together a new ecosystem of public, private, and social sector players within a comprehensive strategic vision and equipping administrations, schools, and teachers with the tools, approaches, and training necessary to unlock the benefits of digital learning at scale. Now, your working group is clearly looking at a much larger canvas, encompassing education for life, disability education, and a range of other issues, concentrating on technology for education for children with disabilities that would replicate across different countries and cultures, as well as addressing issues of skill development, especially in rural areas, these are major issues. The lessons learned from applying new technologies and conventional classrooms can also be applied to alternative and continuing adult education systems. This includes vocational training, traditional artisan training, life skills, and special education needs, including mental health, as has been just been mentioned. The working group must deliberate on how to make education equitable and accessible at all levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, and also encompass vocational and livelihood educations and development of what somebody calls for 21st century soft skills and skills to facilitate lifelong learning. It must also look at the changing nature of knowledge as as uh, Swamiji just mentioned, from the listening to the observing and to the look to the sight measures and how to approach the changing nature of work, even while it must obviously help to preserve traditional skills. For administrators, we must recognize the need for building effective monitoring and feedback loops that help us to reach the last mile. Meanwhile, I understand that your working group will also deliberate on the impact of digitalization on society and environment. Learning from digital India, we must strive to build a digital world model that can bring socioeconomic transformation and support the global fight against poverty through the digital delivery of services, infrastructure creation, and building digital literacies. The health education platform developed by Amrita University can be scaled up India-wide, and I dare say across the region itself in due course. The building up of an Indian language sign learning, learning lab, sign language learning lab will be a unique contribution since digital transformation for an interconnected world should be inclusive and accessible, reduce inequalities and include even low literate users and those with disabilities. In this context, it is impressive that you will be looking at bringing digital transformation even to refugees, as well as building up media digital platforms to showcase culture around the world in order to promote better understanding of different cultures. An inclusive digital architecture based on open and interoperable principles can redefine digital boundaries. As you study these models, including the, measure, the use of digital measuring tools, and gather data for development in emerging technologies, I presume that the policy recommendations you articulate for the brief to be presented at the C20 summit in July will also include some best practices or what we call udaharans that might be replicated optimally across the world, as well across the country, as well as at a global level. Thank you. Thank you so much for providing a comprehensive overview and for encapsulating the essence of the working group's vision. We have an interesting video for you to watch right now. It is a short video about C20 India. 
Civil 20, India 2023 envisions a conception of civil society 2.0 in a world where individual, family, society, market, and state can understand their respective roles better and supplement each other rather than engaging in conflicts. This year, the C20 symbolizes the flame of hope, self-motivation, and selfless service. Amma is grateful to the Indian government for arranging such a high-quality meeting. All the issues raised here are vitally important. This should go beyond a mere physical meeting and become a true meeting, a meeting of hearts and minds. This is the only way to awaken ourselves and others. This year, C20 working groups will focus on Integrated holistic health, mind, body, and environment. Sustainable and resilient communities, climate, environment, and net zero targets. Education and digital transformation. Gender equality and disability. Technology, security, and transparency. Lifestyle for environment. Preservation and conservation of traditional arts, crafts, and culture. Human rights as human values. Revival of rivers and water management. Seva, sense of service, philanthropy, and volunteerism. Vasudeva Kutumbakam. The world is one family. Diversity, inclusion, and mutual respect. SDG 16 and promoting civic space. Delivering democracy through participatory governance. Now, uh, I would like to invite Dr. P. Venkat Rangan, the Vice Chancellor of Amrita to address the gathering. We welcome you, sir. Om Amrudeshwari Nama. My pranams are Nama's Lord's speech. My pranams to our Vice Chairman and most beloved Swami Amrita Swarupananda Puri. Dr. Vijay Nambiar, congratulations to Dr. Prema for organizing this. Remembrance to Dr. Just Mons, whom I met about two, three weeks ago in an interesting occasion here, and all the distinguished people who are gathered here today. I think the C20 has given us a sense of a profound mission, very lofty goals. And with Amma as the leader, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to transform education. I'll just take two minutes. The uh, transformation will be on several dimensions. As an institution of higher learning, we would like to transform into an institution of higher doing as well. In order to do that, faculty have to work with inspired abandon, a missionary zeal, with this vision of C20 and the mission in the mind. With Amma as the leader who instills inspiration, we have a great chance. Students have to learn with interest and inquisitiveness with a role model to transform from ordinary to extraordinary. With students uh, 
have to become future citizens. The word C seems to be extraordinarily important. C20, future citizens. And in, being, in becoming the future citizens, the students have to perceive and practice eternal human values of love, harmony, diversity, nonviolence, etc. Faculty and students, as we transform from being an institution of higher learning to higher doing, faculty and students have to crave for country's development. They have to practice service to feel the pulse and improve the billions at the bottom of the pyramid. This should be an integral part of each and every academic program. The coherence and synergy of the faculty, staff, and students in an institution of higher learning has to be brought out. Each one should build on the other's unique strength. People should be considered more important than the bottom line. And each one should be should practice to see the same spark of life in all beings, irrespective of standing or any other kinds of outward differences. The creativity and curiosity for higher levels of knowledge and awareness should become habitual thinking. In this age, when computation is gaining overwhelming importance, Everything is becoming digital, one, all or none. We have to bring the other C, computation with artificial intelligence and all this stuff. Of course, extraordinarily helpful. But the other C, compassion, is also extremely important. So these two, in a balanced way, the digital Computation, compassion is still analog, in my opinion. And it also represents a sort of balance between carbon and silicon. Computation, the computers is all silicon. And life is all about carbon. So both are in the periodic table, one below the other. So this balance, between compassion and computation, silicon and carbon, higher learning and higher doing, Amma brings that ideal to us. And I wish that we all work with inspired abandon towards this goal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Venkat, for your inspiring address. It gives me immense pleasure to invite our distinguished speaker, Dr. Anil Sahastrabuddhi, to address the gathering. Namaskar. Salutations to all of you, in particular, Swami Sarupa, Amrut Sarupanandaji, and all other dignitaries who are here. Sri Vijay Nambiar, the Vice Chancellor Venkat Rangan, Rema, then Rahu Raman, who invited me here at a very short notice, and I said I will come. Well, it's very exciting and important to be part of this C20 under the G20 under presidentship of India that we are talking about education and digital transformation, which is very, very important in the light of what has been transpiring in the last decade or so. Much before uh, pandemic occurred, we all started using technology, digital technology for education, be it in terms of MOOC courses, be it in terms of online learning, be it in terms of skilling people. But the speed at which it was happening was uh, not as much as what should have happened. But the pandemic forced all of us when the institutions got closed down, there was no option from school onwards till higher education that all the activities started becoming online. The companies also started working, work from home culture increased. Our G20 is a very important platform where we are discussing 
एस टी जी गोल्स वेर एस टी जी फोर मे बी एजुकेशन बट ऑल द सेवेंटीन गोल्स आर इंटर कनेक्टेड रिलेटेड विथ एजुकेशन इफ यू वॉन्ट टू एलिविएट पॉवर्टी यू वॉन्ट टू इंक्रीज द इकोनॉमिक प्रॉस्पेरिटी ऑफ द नेशन एज वेल एज द पीपल ऑफ द वर्ल्ड वी नीड एजुकेशन इफ यू वॉन्ट क्लाइमेट चेंज टू बी अरेस्टेड एंड दे फॉर वी वॉन्ट टू हैव ग्रीन टेक्नोलॉजीज टू बी इम्प्लीमेंटेड अगेन वी नीड एजुकेशन I think education is very important, which connects all other 16 SDG goals. And if you want to achieve them, therefore education becomes significant. But look at very important aspects which uh, earlier speakers, right from Swami Ji, Vijay Nambiar Ji, as well as the Vice Chancellor Venkat Rangan, all spoke about access, equity, quality. Affordability is also very important because the education has to reach to all. sections of the society education must be affordable it should be of high quality it should be accessible to not only normal citizens but also those who are deprived sections of the society be it in terms of remote areas tribal areas rural areas hilly areas where reaching out is so difficult and also those who unfortunately are one in india we call them today as divyangjan that means physically challenged they have not done any fault it is unfortunate that they are born like this so we need to take care of them so inclusivity is the phenomenon and if we have to really create inclusive education if there is nothing else other than technology which will work because you will be able to have speed scale efficiency all in built into the digital part a digital transformation many people say that uh, there will be digital divide there are people who have the technology who do not have yes there are problems even in this in terms of reach of the high fiber high bandwidth connectivity reaching to all the nooks and corners but like in india we were in a position to make every village illuminated lighted by electricity about few years ago we must reach out to all the villages in the country in terms of not 2g 3g but directly 5g 5g connectivity is very very important if we have to reach out only then the education will become affordable only then can we do many things which we have been all envisaging all about that being taken care of by the government we need to also provide devices and also data now data in india is one of the cheapest in the whole world imagine if you compare to many countries in the world including the advanced or the developing the data rates in india are the cheapest and therefore that will not be a problem maybe still device is a problem so students who cannot afford to buy a smartphone or a laptop or a pc we must make arrangements partly by the government by providing to such people and the industry see those who make huge profit under csr activity they must provide to such sections of the society who cannot buy this device and if you do that with the data being so cheap i think we will be reach out to all the segments of the society and give high quality education this is very significant and important because we will not be able to provide the best of the professors who are available in some best institutions in the country or worldwide to be accessible to those remote people unless we use technology so technology on the other side is the one which is enabler it's a great enabler by sitting in the remotest possible place anywhere in the world whether it is in africa whether it is in somalia whether it is in uh, india's tribal area in the northeast if we have the 5g connectivity data and the device i think they can get the education from the best of the professors from be it stanford be it mit be it amruta be it delhi university be it iit bombay be it iit chennai wherever it is i think that is empowerment a student from remote place if one has even if he is bright has to come to a major town or a city and make his education please remember apart from the high fee which is charged in the institutions you will have to stay in a hostel you will have to pay for that accommodation you will have to pay for your food 
So therefore, by staying at home, if the best thing comes at your doorsteps, rather than you going towards the educational institution, educational institution comes to your doorsteps, I think there is a great transformation. And this transformation is only possible through digital means and digital transformation. And that's why these two are highly connected. You also provide skills. We are all talking about education, which leads to no jobs. That is because most of the education many a times in many institutions is theoretical. But students are not aware of where to apply, how to apply, why to apply. And therefore, application of knowledge that is gained is equally important. And therefore, internships become important. And these internships also today can be not only physical, but they can be also virtual. You know, you can provide an online internship, give a standard problem to be solved by the student with guidance, mentorship. They will be able to understand how and where to apply. And that is what is going to be, again, an empowerment. Today, we also have new technologies which are coming in. Artificial intelligence, machine learning. And using all of this, how the level of learning of a student can be understood and what intervention is required in a particular person, you know, individualized learning. I think that is very great power of the technology. In a classroom with 60 students or 50 students, a teacher will be observing them. There is a one positive thing in that, whether their eye contact is there or not, whether he is attentive or not, she is attentive or not, is seen by the teacher. And therefore, we will be in a position to make some amend in the manner in which we are teaching in a classroom. So we are not denigrating the importance of physical classrooms while we are talking about digital technologies and digital transformation. But nevertheless, a teacher with 60 students will not be able to understand at a glance which student will learn through a mechanism of tutorial, who will learn by experiential learning, who will learn by doing, who will do better by doing projects, who will do better by interacting with the peers. It's very difficult to understand that unless you go through for about a few months Whereas today, technology is capable of empowering that. You know, you observe the student, the mechanism in which uh, you are going to answer the questions, what all kind of things you like, all of that can be done through the use of technology. And that's why digital transformation is going to be very crucial. We are at a crossroads post-COVID. We have learned lessons from that. And it is also important for healthcare. It is also important for agriculture. It is also important for entire empowerment of economy. You know, in India, 40% of the digital transactions today take place through our app, which is developed as UPI. How in education we can create an UPI? So today I'm dealing with what is known as National Educational Technology Forum, where how technology can enable our children, our students, to get the best possible education is what is very important. Second important thing is, how do we make content interesting? Well, many a times, even in the classrooms, if the teacher is not in creating that interest amongst the students, they may be physically sitting there because of the rules of the university that you require so much of attendance, otherwise you can't write an examination, but their mind is hovering around outside and sometimes without uh, the knowledge of the teacher, they may be looking into their uh, mobile phone, chatting, WhatsApp, Facebook, all of that will keep happening. And therefore, the content delivery, whether in the classroom or in an online body is, is very, very vital and important. That is why training of faculty members in creating interesting content, which is engaging, which will create inquisitiveness, amongst the students, that bent of mind, which will make them to learn on their own. I think they are the challenges which we all need to address. And I'm aware of uh, the great work that is being done in Amruta University, which has been uh, taking the lead role in the C20G20 Summit of uh, Education and Digital Transformation. And similar to this, many universities, not only in India, but the world over, they have done experiments during this last uh, decade or so, and more so in the last two years of pandemic. We must learn from each other. You talked about computation earlier. Along with computation, you talked about compassion, which is very important for human beings. 
otherwise we have body our mind will go here and there so spiritualism is very important and we need to bring it in our education system values ethics morals high integrity these are all very important if our planet has to survive in all all for possible ways of life and that is why when we are doing all of this along with competition and compassion collaboration is very important this is the third c which is very relevant if we don't collaborate our efforts will be unnecessarily we are repeating the same thing in 10 places we would have worked together and would have achieved one tenth the time one tenth the cost and that is the spirit which which we should go and g20 is that opportunity 20 nations plus 9 i am aware that it is nearly 85% of the economy of the world goes through this G20 nation. Although there are 100 odd nations, these are the most important nations. And if we do transformation, if we do the change, it will catapult other nations also to join this. And then the whole world will become happier, peaceful. And that is what we want in this planet, after all. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you so much, Dr. Sahastra Buddhi, for sharing your valuable inputs and knowledge with us. Now, I request everyone to switch on their cameras to take a group picture to capture and commemorate this auspicious occasion. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. So I have a short message to share with all of you, requesting all CSOs to fill out the forms provided in the chat and introduce yourselves and your organizations in case you all haven't done so yet. Now, I take the opportunity to invite Dr. Prema Nedungadi and Dr. Hughes Monks to present an overview of the Education and Digital Transformation Working Group, the mandate, sub-themes, the expectations and aspirations of the working group, and the call for Udaharans. Good afternoon good morning good evening i'm very pleased to be here i think we'll start with dr prima uh, showing us a little bit the key themes that we will be working on and we'll also share the way forward and see how you can engage in the various activities that will unfold over the coming weeks and months but uh, over to you dr prima prima to start please good evening everybody We'll give a brief overview about um, education and digital transformation. This presentation will touch upon the introduction, our overall goals of the working group, the sub-themes we have formed, the process and workflow, the timeline, and how you can engage with the C20. Our objective is to ensure that civil society voice and evidence-based practices related to both education and digital transformation are considered in G20 discussions and translated into the G20 leaders declaration as policies. I would like to quote Amma's words that education should spread light within and outside, instill awareness, strengthen the deep bond between the student and his nation, the world, 
his fellow human beings and other creatures, nature and God. Now we go on to our sub-themes based on our deliberations and research, background research, talking to experts. We have proposed the following sub-themes for discussion. Inclusive education for diverse learners. That's the first one. Technology enabled learning and future of education. Skill development. Education for life and global citizenship and digital transformation. Now we go into each sub-theme. The first one we are looking at is the inclusive education for diverse learners. And after a lot of deliberations, we propose these following themes to address educational needs of students who have diverse learning needs. We need funding for inclusive education, assistive technologies that are free or low cost and alternative forms of communication for uh, people with special needs and teacher, caregiver, parent, community training and awareness is extremely important to support inclusion. Um, next slide. We also want monitoring at multiple levels. Now the technology enhanced learning and future of education, as many of our speakers spoke today, um, with the global pandemic, there was a huge surge in solutions. Um, however, we found that actual access was not so great during the pandemic. We need to also train individuals to use technology with discernment, addressing misuse and abuse, especially with children. We want to promote the use of technology for education by the workforce and citizens. And there should be real-time technology and monitoring at work the monitoring should be at the country level. Pedagogical innovation enabled by technology. And we want to work with different verticals within the C20 and the G20 to collaborate and make this happen. Skill development. We want to ensure access to quality online skill training for all learners to build resilience against global crisis. To enhance technologies for the marginalized rural communities, persons with disabilities, women, refugees, and migrants. To sustain a continuum approach to skill development from secondary to tertiary education. Support aspirational and futuristic skill development reinforce transnational skills and skill building for cooperation and mobility between G20 countries and beyond. Support virtual skill training and simulation-based assessments. And then there is uh, a very important sub-theme that is education for life, where we, next slide please where we incorporate the service-based activities in schools, colleges, and workplaces, teach people about inspiring and successful individuals who set the right examples. Previous slide, Amal. Include spiritual values, compassion, empathy in academic curriculum. Make counseling and mindfulness activities, yoga, meditation, available at schools and workplace. Educate citizens about their heritage and ancient cultures of their country and regions. Teach from a very early age about moral responsibilities in society. And towards this, we have some action plans. 
we are conducting a worldwide survey to get firsthand responses from people at large to understand their support for education for life. We will also be looking for letters of support from religious and faith leaders, indigenous communities, and we target at least 25 different faiths from 20 countries. There's a very exciting part, the International Youth Parliament, a select panel of reputed youth and individuals from all countries. They will do some research about how education for life, what we talk about the values and the compassion, how does that impact? What are the problems they are finding because of lack of that? And how would such an education help? So we want to gather that from all the countries, G20 countries and more. Next. And some other proposed activities of the working group, we will be building a platform to promote cultures from all over the world in different media to promote peace and harmony. One of our projects that is funded by the Ministry of Electronics and the Ministry of Education, the online labs, virtual labs, we will be making it accessible to a few disabilities and also have the content in many more languages, including languages outside India and offer it free. In terms of digital transformation from one of our CSO organizations outside of India, they have asked us if we could connect refugees with the host communities or the NGOs so that the NGOs and civil society can serve the refugees. So we will be building such a platform and a pilot implementation in Uganda. Now I invite Dr. Just to take on the presentation. Thank you so much. Let me just briefly speak to this uh, slide. As you will have noticed, uh, our working group both has the challenge, but also the honor to cover both education and digital transformation and the interrelation between these two topics. So we treat them separately, but obviously the interrelation, as we have already announced it and spoke to it, is an important aspect to it. Overall, as Dr. Anil said, I mean, um, it is we are really humbled by the fact that we cover education as a cross-cutting theme around across the SDGs. Uh, while at the same time addressing issues around digital transformation, as it really is as a, at a crossroad. I think the digital transformation that is, is unfolding as we live it every day, increasingly, you know, with recent developments such as the chat GPT, really questions us. And it questions uh, us in terms of accessibility. And it also questions us if machines, so to speak, can do many things that humans can do so far, how should we position ourselves? How can we make sure that digital transformation also increases our humanity? So it's a big topic. It's a very big topic. And we've chosen at this point, and of course, we'll be uh, engaging a consultation process around it to look in particular at topics uh, around digital public goods for the, uh, for the SDGs, uh, inclusive human-centered digital transformation, and inclusive innovative ecosystems. Shouldn't be the case that digital trans technology is controlled, owned by just a few, often private companies. Um, important to see also, as Dr. Anil also again stressed, see how we can use technology to enable and to empower. Um, and for that, digital literacy is crucial. Uh, not only for a few, but as broad as possible. And there's a second notion around digital hygiene. Uh, you may have heard about it. That's how do we use the technology in terms of our own private use, our youngsters, our children. We need to instill a sense of responsibility in terms of using these technologies. Big topic around what are quality assurance mechanisms uh, to build human-centered, responsible uh, AI, machine learning, digital tools. 
interoperational standards, and in particular also the ethical uh, regulations and guidelines around digital transformation. This is a topic that's been on the table uh, for quite some time. Many different sort of frameworks have been proposed, including by UNESCO, for instance, but we think that it is important, and that is my next point, next point, is to raise the voice of civil society organizations in these debates, as well as faith-based voices. Everybody talks about it, but I think our role is really exceptional in terms of being able to provide a strong civil society and faith-based voice in this debate. Final point obviously relates to digital accessibility, uh, in particular for people with, um, uh, with certain uh, limitations. Um, so this is a theme that runs across uh, the whole working group. If we move to the next slide, we'll be happy to share a, a list of advisors that we've been able to um, commit so far. This list will probably evolve, and I just want to uh, to speak to the international speakers that we have so far committed. Uh, that involves Professor Michel Carton here from, from Geneva, the Graduate Institute, uh, an eminent expert on skills development. So we're very pleased to have him with us. We're also very pleased to be able to call upon uh, Ambassador Amandeep Singh Gill, who is actually from India, but he is the UN Secretary General's tech envoy uh, in New York, driving in particular major initiative which is called the development of the global digital compact which is a, a key um, framework that is being developed at the un level and we seek connection um, also with that development then we're very pleased to also welcome kuani kier from unesco Mahatma gandhi's institute of education for peace and sustainability uh, very pleased to have you also on board um, we are also pleased to have Professor Hollenweger from Switzerland, uh, one of the international eminent experts on diversity and inclusion, including the technology aspect. And last but not least, uh, Mrs. Veronika Soboleva, who is actually also somewhere here online, uh, who works with a, with a foundation called the ICPC, a global foundation. So that is for the international part. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Prema uh, for the Indian um, experts, advisors that we've been able to commit so far. We have uh, Professor Dr. Kiran Bhujan. He is uh, Director, Tertiary Education and Scientific Research, Ministry of Education, Mauritius. It was an international. And we have Dr. Ramakrishna Rao, All India President, Vidya Bharati, India. We have uh, Ms. Manoranjana Gupta, Public Policy and Advocacy. Dr. Shiv Subramani Krishnamurti, also Brahmachari Ramananda Vrita Chaitanya, Director, MA Center, North America, and Professor Amrita University. Dr. Jayanti Narayanan, Special Educator, Retired Deputy Director of the National Institute for the Mentally Handicapped. Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. Thank you. We can move on to the next slide. Before, um, my role will be to take you through the uh, specific activities, the timeline, and the ways you can engage with us uh, as we unfold our work. But before going there, I just would like to make two or three observations with your permission. Um, as Dr. Venkat said and stressed it, this is a unique opportunity. It's maybe even a once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to inform the G20 um, driven, inspired by our chair, Ama. In that sense, I think this is a great opportunity to raise the voice of civil society organizations, which is hardly needed, as I already said, in these debates. So what we've done, uh, we've looked at the various recommendations that were formulated in the previous C20 uh, gatherings. As you will know, C20 changing chair presidency every year. Last year it was Indonesia. This time, this year, we're very honored. It's the first time that in India actually chairs 
uh, the G20 uh, next year, it will be Brazil. So we try to ensure some continuity uh, in terms of picking up the recommendations that were already formulated. But what we seek to do in addition is to see where are the areas of recommendations where we see gaps or what are the areas of recommendation uh, that inspire us, uh, in particular uh, being inspired by our chair uh, of C20, Sri Amrita Nanda Mayi. So that is what we have done. That's the completed bit. We've done our homework. We've looked, uh, compiled, analyzed also key documents by UNESCO, UNICEF, UN, etc., Digital India, to see uh, what's out there and how we can relate to that uh, to make a meaningful contribution. It's probably not so interesting, with your permission, to make the same recommendations, but we want to give it a specific spin, a specific flavor, um, to reflect uh, India's presidency, but also uh, uh, our own inspiration. So ongoing, what's happening right now, uh, and we're right in the middle of it, and the timelines are rather short, so we, we really don't have much time uh, to waste. Um, identification and invitation of partners, uh, the various organizations that we wish to engage in our work, and this is a great opportunity to get you on board. Um, we started thinking around the areas of recommendation uh, that we want to work on in particular, uh, and we want to have a global uh, actually uh, outreach. Uh, it being understandable that we will very uh, have a very strong Indian component work uh, in component in our work as well. Uh, we're working on a first concept note um, in terms of policy recommendations, which is actually due uh, very quickly. Um, and as of this week, uh, we will start a series of thematic workshops, uh, events, et cetera, uh, that I will talk to just after this slide um, in order to come up. And that's the key outcomes uh, of our work, expected outcomes of our work, is to come up with uh, meaningful, innovative, inspiring policy recommendations Two, um, and the second key objective, uh, as it was already mentioned, is to identify a number of udarans, and you have to apologize my pronunciation, or best practices uh, of, um, of the organizations that engage with us, um, examples, experiences that can be shared uh, amongst G20 and beyond, um, and that will uh, provide concrete tools uh, and examples for us to move ahead. The next slide, please. And before I go there, actually, as I was speaking to uh, our global uh, outreach ambition, I'm very pleased to report, at least from the information that I have seen, uh, that we have a global participation already today. We have participants from Ethiopia, Slovenia, Turkey, Sri Lanka, India, various regions, Switzerland, France, the United States of America, South Africa, Mauritius, Philippines, Indonesia, Spain, Russia, and Germany. And I probably uh, missed a few, uh, but this is for us already a very strong signal and a very positive signal uh, in terms of being able to uh, gather interested parties, civil society organizations, and individuals in our work. So what will happen over the coming months? Uh, we are at the inaugural meeting today. We will actually have our very first workshop uh, around each of the sub-themes that Dr. Prema presented to us this Sunday. Uh, and you're all invited to join. Uh, this will be a session where we really start working um, teasing out the key elements of the recommendations, uh, going a step further in uh, articulating these. Uh, so that is coming Sunday. Uh, Amal, could you please uh, share the link for that event also in the chat so that people can uh, register if they wish to participate. This information will also be available on our website. Then an important milestone will be set in uh, Nagpur. Uh, in March, uh, end of March uh, of this year, the inception conference uh, of C20, where all the other working groups will also come together and where we will also look on how do we connect amongst our working groups, which is 
a key concern um, that uh, we all share. Then during the months of March, April, and May, we'll have a number of thematic net networking events uh, on which you will be kept informed through our website. Uh, there will be a symposium on education um, held at, in Manipur in, in end of April. Uh, an important conference will happen in May. Uh, <clears throat> that's the symposium on education and digital transformation. One of our key events uh, with the idea of having our key recommendations uh, finalized uh, by, uh, or at least well advanced in that face-to-face -face meeting in Surat in Gujarat. Finally, um, and this is where we all will, will meet, uh, Ambassador um, uh, Nambiar uh, and the whole team, um, the, the, the summit that will take place in Jaipur um, in July. So this is roughly the timeline that we will be working with. Um, other topics, other events uh, are likely to, uh, to come up uh, as we go, as we create the momentum um, in our work. Can I have the next slide, please? So specifically in terms of the of uh, of these two elements of outcome that I mentioned earlier, the policy the the sorry the the policy recommendations uh, and the best practice identification. Uh, this is roughly what we uh, hope to achieve. Um, goes quite fast with the first concept note, uh, then the various events that will inform uh, our policy recommendations, a call, uh, and that will also be on our website to organizations around the world to share uh, their best practices, the UDA runs, which we would also like to highlight. And then finally in July um, in Jaipur, uh, the policy brief that should be available and reflecting our work and the areas of recommendation uh, that we wish to offer uh, to G20. Next slide, please. So how can you engage? And this is really an important aspect of this presentation. Um, and there is actually, you can um, take a, a screenshot of the QR code in terms of registration, uh, connecting, engaging with our work. For civil society organizations or NGOs, there's four main avenues uh, through which you can engage with the work. Uh, that is one offer to host uh, side events, workshops under the sub themes that are proposed. And actually we, we've already got some uh, interest here for organizations that wish to take this up uh, and help us uh, build momentum and insights into the areas of policy recommendation. So that's one. Two, policy dialogues. Participate in our, in, in our events, uh, participate in our meetings, uh, potentially also on location um, in the events that we have planned for that purpose uh, and inform our work. Third element, and again, this reflects what I said earlier, please share your examples share best practices uh, that you would like to showcase internationally and that you think are uh, valuable for the work that we are doing. Finally, and this is more like the advocacy side of it, the lobbying side, uh, which is something that is a continuous effort, obviously, is to lobby, advocate for the recommendations that we will be formulating in these two important areas. Uh, so because the end, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, uh, I, I would like to say in the sense that recommendations are good, but it's their implementation that is critical. So we can have the best recommendations, but we need to make sure that they're picked up and that they feed into national policy and international policy processes. So that's on the CSO NGO level, as individuals, of course, you're also most welcome to join our work um, as an advisor, as an expert uh, in our working group. The topics that we've shared with you are, uh, are numerous, uh, uh, not necessarily always easy. I mean, this is complicated material part of it. So additional expertise on the topics that we've shared that you think you could offer and provide would be highly welcomed. Also, of course, an invitation to you to serve as a speaker in our various events 
And then last but not least, please don't hesitate to reach out to your network, um, try to mobilize as many organizations and individuals around the important work that we are engaging and that we are starting, uh, let's say officially uh, as of today. Of course, we've done already a lot of work, but this is the initial, uh, the official kickoff uh, and the invitation to you to please join us as we unfold, uh, implement our work. That's it, I think, in terms of, um, of the process, uh, the overview of the different topics that we, uh, that we have identified and that we wish to work on, that we've already sort of started spelling out. Um, but it is very much up to the interactions that we hope fruitful and numerous uh, with the various organizations um, that can register through this form or that have already registered through the form uh, to build uh, momentum uh, and useful work. Anything you would like to add, Dr. Prema here? That's wonderful. Uh, Dr. Joost Monks has summarized it so well. Uh, again, it's an opportunity for us to work together, collaborate, and come up with something useful to the world. That is what our Chancellor Amma has, and Chair of C20 has been guiding us all the time. And I'm so grateful that you're all here. And I request you to please work with us, share your expertise, and together let's have an evidence-based policy discussions and outcomes. Thank you so much, Dr. Prema and Dr. Joost, for your wonderful explanation of the slides and overview of the next steps. Now, I would like to invite uh, Veronica Sobolova for the from the IPC, ICPC Global Foundation to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, thank you so much. It's been an amazing event. It's a very beautiful beginning uh, of the long process uh, that we will hopefully all go through together and contribute to this wonderful topic. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, our inspiration, our honorable chair of the Civil Society 20, a part of G20 2023, Shri Mata Amritanda uh, Amma. I would like to thank our eminent guests, uh, Swami Amrita Surapananda, Dr. Prema, Mr. Ambassador Vijayana Biar, Dr. Rangan, Professor Anil, uh, Dr. Just Monks, and uh, Dr. Venkat Rangan. Um, I would also like to spe especially thank our guest today. Uh, it was the first event of the series, and um, I'm sure and confident that by having our efforts together we can easily reach the goal of the one earth one family and one future sharing the most amazing best practices that you have to bring learning from the communities and making sure that it doesn't only stay on the paper but actually like um, our speakers mentioned today it will get uh, into the practice and uh, hopefully together we can facilitate this process as much as possible um, so if you have anything to share with us, uh, there are all the details that has been shared in the chat here. We're also inviting you to join our Sunday event and um, encourage your friends, you know, some organizations that you are working with to join this effort together. And again, um, we've suggested today some formats of collaboration for CSOs or nonprofits, as well as for individuals, but it's not only limited to these uh, proposals. So if you have anything in mind, we are very open and happy to discuss and welcome all the ideas and suggestions here. We wish everyone a very successful and uh, collaboration and um, looking forward to see you at the next events. Thanks so much. Dr. Prema. Thank you, Dr. Veronica. Veronica has been a huge source of support for us, connecting us with 
the NGOs at an international level and working very closely, meeting us every week. She's part of the core committee. Thank you. It's my honor and hopefully together we can do amazing things. With this, we come to the end of our uh, first inaugural session, and we look forward to your active participation in all our upcoming events, which will greatly aid in the development of evidence-based, action-oriented policy discussions and outcomes. Om Namah Shivaya. Thank you, everyone. And thanks everyone who has been actively participating in the discussion uh, on this Zoom working session. I saw there were some questions and one of the questions uh, question was about uh, creating um, WhatsApp groups or you know some easy ways to communicate among those people who are already engaged. Um, so uh, we already have official WhatsApp groups. Uh, they are focused on subtopics and we will be sharing this information with all of the participants after the event. Thank you so much. And hope to see you all soon again. So this is it. Yeah.